Let's look at Matthew chapter 26 and verse 17. Now the first day of the feast of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? And he said, Jesus said, Go into, uh, go into the city to such a man, and say unto him, The master saith, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had appointed them, and they made ready the Passover. Now I'm going to ask you, if you will, just for a moment to leave your Bibles open, because I want to go back in just a second, and I want to prove to you, I'm going to tell you something, then I'm going to prove it to you from the Bible, and then we're just going to take a trip through God's Word tonight. Let's pray. Father, bless your Word. Help us tonight as we study the Word together. And I pray, Jesus, you'll be glorified and honored, and most of all, that sinners may be convicted and convinced of their need for the Savior, and then may they do something about it. Maybe anybody that sits in this service that's unsaved. And then for those of us that are saved, help us to rejoice over the great salvation that we have in the person of the Lord Jesus. So bless now tonight the uh, study of God's Word. Speak to those listening and watching. And Lord, may our hearts be open, our ears be attentive tonight to the Word of God. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, for the last several months, I have been emphasizing certain words that we find in the Bible. In fact, if you remember, think back over these many weeks, I actually took our English alphabet and kind of use that as an outline and work all the way through the Bible, pointing out certain words that I feel like they're important to us as God's people as we live out the last days on the earth. In fact, if I counted them right, there was almost 100 words that we have been over recently uh, in these Wednesday evening services. Well, I'm now ready to move on to the next series of uh, sermons for Wednesday evenings. However... Before I, I get started in all of that, I want to emphasize one more word. You know, one of the best ways to study the Bible is to study the words of the Bible. You can take certain words that we find in our Bible, we kind of follow them through the Scripture and just kind of get an entire message from just one word. And that's what I want to do in this service tonight. If you'll think back, and I can't remember if it, I, thought, I want to say it was week number 19 or somewhere along in there, but on week number 19 of our study of great words of the Bible, we were on the letter S. And I mentioned several words in our Bible that begin with the letter S that you and I ought to be familiar with. For instance, I mentioned the word Sabbath. Sabbath. And then I mentioned the word sovereign. And then I mentioned the word stronghold. And then I mentioned the word servant. And all of those are certainly good Bible words. However, tonight, and I almost used this word back when we were on uh, the S's, but I just, it's just too much to say about it and, and, and try to work in three or four other words. So I want to go back tonight and pick up one other, one other word that begins with the letter S. And what I want to do tonight, since we're in between last series and starting a brand new series of messages, I'd like first to have a little bit of fun tonight, just following this word through the Bible. Now, the word that I want us to look at tonight is the word such. And what I want to do tonight is just kind of follow that word through because believe it or not, when I, when I start pointing out this word and how it's used throughout the Bible, we get a picture of the story of our lives as the people of God from just looking at the little word such. I'm telling you, somewhere along the way tonight, you're going to meet yourself in that word. In fact, tonight I'm preaching on this subject right here. I'm preaching on poof, poof. Old brother such. Old brother such. As I said a moment ago, I'd really like for us to have some fun so I want you to think with me along the lines tonight of old brother such being a man. Now I want to prove it to you, but look in our text tonight. The disciples have come to the Lord. It's time for the Passover. They begin with the Feast of Unleavened Bread. They come to Jesus and they say, Now Jesus, we've got to have a place for us to get together to celebrate the Passover. Where do you want to do that at? Well, in verse number 18, And Jesus said unto them, Go into the city to...
So evidently, such is a man. Because Jesus said, you're going to find such a man. And so tonight, would you kind of just gear your minds along the idea of thinking of such as a man? And I'm preaching tonight on that thought, old brother such. And I want us to kind of see the story of our lives in the life of old brother such. All right? So let's do this tonight. Let's get started. Uh, stay with me for just a moment. You're going to have to probably look up on the screens a whole lot. But I want to say i got seven things. I'll do it quick. But i got seven things I'd like to say about old brother such. All right? Let's get started. Number one, old brother such was a sinner. Old brother such was a sinner. You know, one of the first things we find out about old brother such is the fact that he was a sinner. Let me prove it to you. Over in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter number 6, the Bible said this, Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. He goes on to say, he goes on to say, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And then the very next verse he says this, and such were some of you. Jesus said, Paul is talking about all those people and all the terrible things that's going on in their life, which is the evidence of the fact that they're a sinner. And then he goes on to say, do you know something? Old brother such was just like that one time. And such were some of you. He was a sinner. You know something? Just like old brother such, we're all just old sinners. I mean, the truth of the matter is we all are broken. We all have a bend toward evil. I mean, when we were born into this world, we were born with a sin nature. God placed us upon this earth for one reason and one reason only, and that was that we might bring pleasure to the heart of God and to do the will of God. But, buddy, I'll tell you something. You and I chose to go our own way, to do our own thing, and the end result of all of that was we were just like old brother such. We were idolaters, and we were adulterers, and, and we were we were big drunkards and extortioners and thieves and liars. I'm here to tell you, just like old brother such, we're all sinners. Now, I know what you may be sitting there thinking tonight. I'm not that bad. Can I tell you something? I get it. You see, the truth of the matter is all of us are in the pit of sin. But not everybody has sank to equal depths in that pit of sin. You know, some people are in the miry clay of the pit of sin and they're only up to their ankles in sin. Other people go a little bit further and, man, they mire up to their knees in sin. Some people are a little worse off. They go up to their waist in sin. There's some people, man, that get up to their shoulders and then there's some people that just, man, sin just takes plumb over their life and they get head over their head in Sin, But the truth of the matter is, whether you're ankle deep or whether you're head deep, the truth of the matter is, we're all in the pit. Can I have an amen? We're all in the pit of sin. And listen, there's no way out. You can't get out of the pit of sin on your own. There's no ladder high enough. There's no rope long enough. There's no steps deep enough to get us out of the pit of sin. And there's no way you and I by our first birth that we can get into heaven. No way whatsoever. We are all, just like old such, old brother such, we are all sinners. You see, I'm still, preacher, I still am not convinced it. We all go back to that 1 Corinthians chapter 9, chapter 6, verse 9, the very first one. Uh, go to the second one. Stop right there. Go back to that first one. Let me ask you something. Have you ever told a lie before? What do we call people that lie? What? And you've told a lie? What does that make you? What does that make me? Well, don't say that about me. <laughs> We're liars. Let me ask you a question. You ever had a bad thought? Old stinking dirty bad thought? 
Jesus said, Whosoever looketh on a man to lust after her hath already committed adultery in his heart. So if you had an old terrible thought to ever cross your mind, Jesus said that makes you what? A what? A what? So now I get it. We're lying adulterers. You ever took something that belonged to you? Maybe a piece of candy? Maybe a dime off the shelf or something like that. Maybe you went to a convenience store and stole a piece of bubble gum one time. Have you ever done that before? Have you ever took something that did? What do we call people that, that take stuff that don't belong to them? What do we call them? What? Oh, I get it now. We're lying adulterous thieves. That's what we are. I said all that to say this. We are sinners. The very best one of us in this room tonight is a sinner. We're lying, adulterous thieves. Can I have an amen? In fact, here's what the Bible said about it, Romans 3, 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Still need more convincing? Solomon did a worldwide search out of all of humanity, and here are his findings. There's not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Hey, can I tell you something about old brother Such? He was a sinner. And every mother's child that's, been, that's sitting in this room, if you've been born of a woman, guess what? Welcome to the world of sin. We are sinners. So number one, old brother Such was a sinner. Now let's take it a step further. Number two, not only was old brother Such a sinner, but old brother Such was sentenced. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, the next time we read about old brother, brother such, here's what we read about it. John 8, verse 5. Now, Moses in the law commanded us that... Come on, Jill. That old brother such ought to be stoned. I mean, man, I'm telling you, because we are sinners, we are under the judgment and we're under the wrath and we're under the condemnation of God. I mean, all we got to look forward to is a bunch of sinners, a bunch of lying, adulterous, thieving sinners. All we've got to look forward to is death and judgment. I realize we're living in the 21st century. I realize that certainly a lot has changed in these days. But there's one thing that will never change, and that's this fact. God still hates sin. That will never change. God still hates sin. And by the way, let me say it like this. God still hates our sin. He hates the fact that we're lying. He hates the fact that we're thieves. He hates the fact that we're adulterous. God despises that. Hey, let me tell you, he's not just definitely against that. He is destructively against that. Here's what we're told once again in our Bible. The Bible said in Ezekiel chapter number 18 and verse number 20, the first sentence, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Hey, you know something? We got records in our Bible where somebody lied and God killed them. We got records in our Bible where somebody committed adultery and God killed them. We got records in our Bible of somebody who stole and God just killed them. I think most of us will live and die without ever fully understanding how much God hates our sin. We got this picture of God as some kind of doting grandpa. But let me just say something, friend. He's more than just a doting grandpa. He's more than just a member of our posse. He's more than just a man upstairs. He's more than just this lovey, uh, lovey kind of a dovey God that wants to get everybody together and just have one big old group hug. I'm telling you, God is a holy God, and he's greatly and highly offended by our sin, and he's moved toward us in great indignation and anger and wrath because we're sinners. Yes, sir. Old Brother Such was a sinner. Old Brother Such was sentenced. If you're lost tonight in this room, can I tell you something? The wrath of God is abiding on your head. John 3, 36, the Bible said, He that hath the Son hath life. 
And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life, but the wrath of God, the anger, the fury, the indignation of God abideth on the head of that individual. I'm telling you, if I was unsaved tonight, I would run to Jesus and get out from under the wrath of Almighty God. Oh, John the Baptist was preaching one day, and he was preaching about Jesus, and he looked at people, and the Bible said that he warned them to flee from the wrath of God to come. I'm telling you, man, God is angry about our sin. Oh, brother, such was a sinner. Oh, brother, such was sentenced. But then number three, <laughs> oh, brother, such got saved. Oh, brother, such got saved. I mean, he was a mess. I mean, he was a lying, thieving, adulterous, drunkard, extortioner, Whatever else that list said, I'm telling you, he was up to his eyeballs in sin. I mean, he was shoulder deep over his head in sin. But thank God there came a day when old brother such that was a sinner who was under the sense of the, uh, the sentence of the wrath of God. Thank God he got saved by the grace of God. I'll prove it to you. Look at this verse right here. Praising God and having favor with all, all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily. <laughs> oh, brother Such got saved. I don't know how it all came to pass, but I do know this. The day old brother Such got saved, Simon Peter was doing the preaching. And I want you to know he just stood up and reared back and preached and he accused that whole crowd, thousands and thousands of people that was gathered there in the city of Jerusalem that day. He accused that whole crowd of being the very people who put to death the Lord Jesus, the Son of the living God. Buddy, I want to tell you, old brother such got under such deep conviction. He saw on his hands the blood of the Son of God. He realized it was his sins that put Jesus on the cross of Calvary. And when old Peter preached, and then the Holy Spirit came and walked down the aisles of that or up the streets of that city that day. He got under conviction and when they started singing the hymn of invitation, oh, brother such, walked down the aisle and gave his heart to Jesus and got gloriously saved. I said a moment ago, there's no ladder high enough. There's no rope long enough. There's no steps deep enough to get us out of the pit of sin. But I'm glad tonight I can point you to a Savior whose arm is long enough and his hand is strong enough to lift us out of the pit of our sin. No matter how far down you and I may have gone. Yes, sir. His name is Jesus. Can I stop and say this? The Baptist couldn't do that for me. Let me just say if you happen to be from some other denominational flavor... They can't do that for you. There's no denominational flavor under, this, under the sun that can get you out of the mess of your sin. You can't turn over enough new leaves. You can't do enough good works. But, buddy, I'll tell you what you can't do. Thank God Jesus can. And that's why we try to point people to Jesus. Oh, brother, such got saved. The Bible said the Lord added to the church daily. Such. And then let me tell you what, and this is not in the message tonight, but after he got saved, old brother Such got baptized. And old, ba old, old brother Such joined the church, got in a good church. Can I stop and say, you know, that's kind of my story. I was a sinner. I was sentenced, but then came the good day when I got saved by the grace of God. I saw on my hands the blood of the Son of God. I understood how it was my sins that put him there. It just wasn't yours or somebody that uh, out here in this old world, the drunk or the dope addict or the, or the lady that lives down on Harlan Avenue. It was just not them, but it was, a, it was a good moral boy that had been brought up in church all of his life. And I saw the blood of God's Son on my hands. I realized I put him on that cross. Thank God the Holy Ghost passed by and I walked down the aisle and I gave my hand to the preacher and my heart to Jesus and I got saved and then I got baptized and then I joined the church not just any church I got myself in a good church yes sir how many y'all with me old brother such was a sinner old brother such was sentenced old brother such got saved but we ain't done with him yet because we run into him again. Guess what? Old brother such got stirred. He got stirred up about getting saved. You see, the next time we meet old brother such, 
It's over the Gospel of John, chapter number 4, verse 23. For the Bible said, The hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh... Oh, brother, such, he got saved, he got baptized, he got in a good church, and then he got stirred up about living for God. The, the Bible said God came looking for old brother such, and he got stirred up about worshiping God. He started worshiping the one who saved him. I read just, uh, it just happened a couple of weeks ago, and you may saw it on our news here in this area, but down off the coast of the, uh, of the coast of North Carolina, off the Aller Banks, just a couple of weeks ago, this man, he was out on a boat by himself, and, uh, and, he, and he was fishing by himself. Well, he, he, uh, he, he kind of cut his motor, throttled it back, and he went over to the side. He was checking on something over here, and a wave come along and kind of rocked the boat a little bit. And, and when it did, it just flipped him right out into the water. And unfortunately for him, he didn't have his kill switch on. It's my understanding, when you're out on a boat by yourself, you better be wearing your kill switch. He didn't have that kill switch hanging around his neck. So while he was out there trying to get up, you know, kind of get back to the top of the water, his old boat just kind of puttered away from him. It kind of took off from him and just left him out there in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, miles off the coast, bobbing up and down in the water. Well, several miles away, there was a man and his son who were out fishing. You may have saw the story. The man, his man, this man and his son, they were out fishing, when all of a sudden, I mean, here come this boat with nobody in it, just puttering by them. Well, they saw that manless boat, and they thought, oh, man, something's wrong. So they... They chased the boat down. They pulled up beside of it, and they boarded the boat. And when they got on the boat, they, they used the GPS tracking system on that boat to kind of retrace where that boat had went. And guess what? When they got in that general vicinity, off in the distance, they saw that man out there waving his hands in the Atlantic Ocean. Help! You know, he's hollering, help somebody, hoping they'd see him. And sure enough, they saw him. They went over, they rescued him. They said when they got him into the boat, he was so exhausted, he just slumped down and fell onto the bottom of the boat. And all he could say was, thank you, thank you, thank you. And they showed it a couple of days later. He was in the hospital giving him fluids and all that stuff, trying to get him built back up. And all he could do laying in the hospital bed was brag on the people who had rescued him from certain death and destruction. I got to thinking about that. You know what ought to happen this Sunday morning? I mean, before the preacher gets up and preach, somebody ought to say, preacher, right before you get started, can I say a word? And I'll say, say on, brother. Say on, sister. And somebody ought to say, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I was out on the sea of sin, bobbing up and down, about to go down for the last time. But thank God the old ship of Zion pulled up beside me. Somebody threw me the lifeline of grace. I came on board. Somebody ought to say, preacher, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Worship. Man, we ought to coach. So, hey, look, guess what? You don't have to go to hell. Why? Somebody came to where you were. Somebody found you lost. Somebody rescued you. Somebody threw your lifeline. His name was Jesus. And the response ought to be, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I tell you, bless your heart, I, I don't want to quench anybody that wants to worship. You say, preacher, you ought to set so-and-so down once in a while. Set them down. I'm not trying to set them down. I want them to get stirred up because this is the quietest world you and me is ever going to live in. And we ought to get started. Hey, I, heard the, I read today, somebody made the quote that when it comes to worship over yonder, God's going to have to put some people in worship 101 class because they ain't worship down here. They're not going to know how to worship when they get over there. But friend, I don't want it to be new over over there. I want to go ahead and get warmed up down here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Help me. I'm telling you, old brother such got stirred. Kind of, hey, y'all ain't getting this. But I sure am glad I got saved. 
I'm glad I got SAV capital, all cap letters, thank God. Got saved by the grace of God because I was a sinner and I was sentenced to die. I got saved and every once in a while, it don't happen a lot, but I get stirred up about getting saved. Oh, brother, such got stirred. Then I hate to tell you this. Oh, brother, such strayed. Oh, brother, such. Oh, brother. Old brother, such. Oh, brother, oh, brother, such. He strayed. Let me read the story to you. I don't know exactly how it all came about. Now the works of the flesh are manifest with these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. Idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. Envians, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and... Oh, brother. Here's an old boy that was a sinner. And he was sentenced. And he got saved. Then he got stirred. And then something happened. I don't know what it was, but his enthusiasm began to wane. His fire began to die down. His shout wasn't as loud. His testimony wasn't as often. His love for the Savior wasn't as evident as it used to be. And he fell into the flesh. And the flesh led him in a place that God never intended for him to be. God got him out of one mess... He got over all that, started following the flesh, and fell right back into a, another mess. Can I tell all of us in this room something tonight? But any time a child of God starts giving in to the flesh, things are going to take a dramatic turn for the worst. Anytime you and I yield to old fleshly desires and fleshly appetites and worldly ways, I'm just here to tell you, friend, you mark her down. Things are going to take a dramatic turn in our life for the worst. Ask anybody who's been saved, stirred up about living for God, who gets uh, st strays away from God, backslides, gets out of the will of God, gets back out of here in the world. I'm here to tell you they're miserable. Can I tell you something? The most miserable person in this world tonight is not the lost sinner out here in the world. The Bible said there's pleasures in sin for a season. But the most miserable person in the world tonight is a child of God who's turned his back on God and is trying to go back out there in the world, but he can't enjoy the world because that's not who he is, and he can't enjoy God because he's at a distance from God. You talk about misery. A person away from God is a miserable person person. Oh, brother such, he strayed. But can I say this? Oh, brother such, never lost his salvation. <laughs> Aren't you glad? Aren't you thankful tonight that the Lord will never take back his salvation? It stands to reason if I can't get good enough to get saved, then I can't get bad enough to get lost. Can I have an Amen. Aren't you glad we're Baptists tonight? Are you glad to be a Baptist? Say amen. I heard about these old three preachers. It was a Monday morning, and one was a Presbyterian, one was a Pentecostal, and one was a Baptist preacher. And they met at a restaurant, and, and they were eating breakfast, just talking about how things went at church yesterday. And somehow or another, the, in the conversation, it turned toward the Apostle Paul. And, and, and it turned from the Apostle Paul, the conversation went, to which kind of church Paul would join if he were to come back today. Well, the old Presbyterian spoke up first. He said, well, I'd like to think that if Paul come back today, he'd join the Presbyterian church. He'd appreciate our scholarism and our intellectualism. Without doubt, he would join the Presbyterian church. Well, the old Pentecostal preacher said, I happen to disagree with you. He said, I think if Paul come back today, he'd join the Pentecostal church. He would like our fire and our enthusiasm and our worship. Oh, yeah, without doubt, without doubt, he'd be a Pentecostal. Well, the old Baptist preacher didn't say anything, and one of them looked over at him and said, ain't you got nothing to say? He said, yeah. He said, I don't think he'd change. <laughs> Aren't you glad to be a Baptist? <laughs> I'm glad I got saved, born again, washed in the blood of Jesus and dwelt by the Holy Ghost, but I'm glad God put me in a good Baptist church. You can't get no better doctrine than you find in the Baptist church. 
I like one of our most precious doctrine in the Baptist church is this, the impossibility of losing your salvation once you get saved. You call it whatever you want to, once saved, always saved, eternal security, whatever you want to call it. I'm just saying, friend, old such may have strayed, but he never lost his salvation. Let me tell you something, bless your heart about eternal life. Eternal life is not something you get when you get to heaven. Eternal life is what you get when you believe on Jesus. Yeah, man. You don't have to wait to heaven to get your eternal life. The very moment you believe in your heart that Jesus is the Son of God, you accept Him as your Savior, guess what? Not only does He move in, but thank God when He moves in, He brings eternal life in with Him. Can I have an amen? And it is an impossibility for you ever to lose your eternal salvation. Oh, brother, such got cold. Oh, brother, such strayed. But he didn't lose his salvation. I can prove it to you. The Bible said this, Revelation 20, verse 6, On such, the second death hath no power. The first death is a physical death. When our soul departs from our body, whatever causes that, stroke, heart attack, cancer, car wreck, gunshot, stabbing, drowning, whatever causes that, the moment we die, our soul departs from our body, physical death. But that second death that that verse is talking about is not talking about the moment that the soul departs from the body. It's talking about the second death, the moment that the soul that has departed from the body departs from God. Forever and ever and ever. And we call that hell. Amen. Hell is a place that man is eternally separated from God. And the Bible said, and the Bible said, and the Bible said on such the second death. Man that is born once will die twice. Man that is born twice will die once. <laughs> Aren't you glad you've been born again? Aren't you glad you've been saved by the good grace of God? Thank God I might stray, I might get cold, I might be, get like a cold as a hound's nose, my heart may become as cold as the other side of the pillow in the middle of the night, but I'm so glad I can't lose my salvation. It is an eternal work of God, and whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Ecclesiastes 3.14, there's nothing we can do about it. Not that I want to. I'm glad I can't lose my salvation. All right, now we're done. So go back. Oh, brother, such was a sinner. Oh, brother, such was sinners. Oh, brother, such got saved. Oh, brother, such got stirred. Oh, brother, such strayed. Oh, brother, such never lost his salvation. Number seven. Oh, brother, such was snatched. I don't know exactly how it all happened, but I do know this. He got to missing one day. Yes, sir. People wondered about what happened to old brother such. I mean, they searched and they searched and they searched, but they could not find him. I mean, one moment he was right there. And the next moment, he was gone. They called the police department and the police put out APBs looking for him. They plastered his name on milk cartons in his face. His picture appeared on the back of tractor and trailers. Have you seen... Oh, brother, such. But he was gone. I know what happened to him. For the Bible said, such and one was caught up to the third heaven. That phrase caught up, that's the word rapture. I can read that verse like this. Oh, such was raptured to the third heaven. And brother, bless your heart, some of these days when the Lord comes, I mean sinners, sinners, but God saved and stirred, and sometimes we stray, but we can't lose our salvation. But someday when Jesus comes, we're going to get snatched. And lo and behold, I'm going to be here one moment, and the next minute, I'm going to be whoosh, caught up to the third heaven. And I found out one more thing about old brother such. Old brother such has got a sister in the Bible. And old brother such's sister is old sister much. 
and I'm going to let you such search out the muches of the Bible. But is that not our story? We done met ourselves right there in the Word of God in the life of old brother such. And thank God <laughs> for old sister much. Much more than being now saved by his blood. Amen. We shall be saved from wrath. Romans 5, 9, through him. Thank God for sister much. Thank the Lord. What a good Savior that we have. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for old brother such.